I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website, DollarCollapse.com. Welcome back to the show, John, and our first chance to talk since the U.S. election. Yeah, Jim, a lot has happened since you and I talked two weeks ago. Now, um, I've never seen protests after an election before. I mean, the president-elect hasn't done anything yet. Yeah, well, he antagonized a lot of people along the way. And, you know, there, there are so many interesting elements to this. You know, There was a guy on Saturday Night Live, Dave Chappelle, did a, um, um, a monologue in which, you know, he's a black guy, and he said, um, on TV last night, I just got to watch a white people riot. <laughs> you know, because we don't have, uh, you know, middle-of-the-road granola white people protesting things um, in a violent way very often. So it's, it's an unusual thing here in the U.S. And um, it's also interesting because Trump, during the campaign, um, intimated that he wouldn't accept necessarily the results of the election. And that completely freaked out a lot of people in the political class. You know, he's destroying the the uh, integrity of our democratic system, yada, yada. And, and, and it's interesting that after the election, which nobody claims was stolen or anything, you know, that we've got people out there protesting the election and, try, and calling it illegitimate and trying to overturn it. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's, it, it kind of reinforces one of the really disturbing aspects of U.S. politics, which is that we're willing to accept things from our guys that we're not willing to accept from the other side so that basically everybody who gets elected gets this uh, blank check to violate the constitution any way they want to because their guys will accept that and that you know that 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 explains a lot of supreme court rulings a lot of um, executive decisions on the part of past presidents you know so we're, we're doing things that are clearly blatantly unconstitutional but we're getting away with it because our guys, or, or their guys, allow it. You know, whoever's in charge, the people that back them, are willing to let them go to extreme um, lengths to to do the things they want to do policy-wise, and the hell with the Constitution. And that's really disturbing because you're, we're just being, you know, we're creating a, a what, what a lot of people call a turnkey totalitarian state here in the U.S. And it's just waiting for somebody crazy to take over it and just, uh, you know, flip the switch, and, and they've got a police state here. And so now we handed that, you know, a, a state that can read our emails and pick us up at will without uh, without due process and do all kinds of other things. We've handed that to kind of an unknown quantity now. You know, we just don't know what Trump's national security and civil unrest, et cetera, et cetera, policies are going to be, and whether he believes free speech is, is a, you know, a real thing or, or optional or not. And he's got the, uh, the militarized police now and the surveillance state available to enforce his will, whether it's constitutional or not. This is all pretty scary. But maybe it's a wake-up call. I tend to think it's not. I, t- I tend to think that we're, we're veering into um, even darker political waters and that Trump is a, a sign of that process rather than a one-off thing. Who are these protesters? Half the U.S. population didn't bother to vote. Are these people folks who didn't bother going to a voting booth? <laughs> well, a lot of the people who are being arrested in protests around the U.S., you know, they, they check them out and figure out who they are and everything. Um, they're, they're turning out not to have voted in the state in which they were arrested during the, the past election. So we don't know whether they, they didn't vote anywhere, but we, we do know that 
there are a lot of people crossing state borders in order to protest, which implies that there's some organization there. This isn't people necessarily just um, spontaneously rising up. This is a, a, an organized busing of protesters from one place to another, um, which, again, shouldn't be a surprise. You know, this is the kind of stuff that goes on now on both the right and the left. This isn't a partisan thing. This is just um, an acknowledgement that most of the major players out there have decided that um, fair play and constitutionally permitted activities are things that are, you know, they're optional, they're situational. And that is deeply disturbing, you know. It's uh, it's why there's so much corruption everywhere in the U.S. right now, and that's because people have decided that the rules don't apply to them. When they accumulate a little bit of power, they become an aristocracy, they do what they want to do. And it's true of the political class, it's true of the financial class, and, of course, the uh, the major corporate class. You know, CEOs, big bankers, um, entrenched politicians, they all do pretty much whatever they want to and don't really pay much attention to the rule book because they don't think it applies to them. Well, I've noticed that if you violate the Constitution in Canada or the U.S., there are no penalties set down on law for doing that. Yeah. Well, it, it, it used to be that there was a court system that um, allowed you to bring a case against a part of a government that's violating the Constitution, and the court would uphold the Constitution and say, no, no, government, you can't do that. That has changed so much in the last um, 20 or 30 years. You know, the, the uh, government has gained the ability in the U.S., at least, to basically run the economy in ways that were were never envisioned by the, uh, the the framers of the Constitution. And more recently, um, we, we've gotten the ability, the government has gotten the, the ability to do things in the, you know, the, in, in surveillance and in um, incarceration that are also unconstitutional. They're clearly, you know, listening in to millions of phone calls all at the same time, that is clearly a violation of our right to privacy and our right to be free of unreasonable search and seizure and, and uh, you know, stop and frisk laws, which seem to have been upheld by the courts, are also clearly, you know, if you don't have probable cause to pick somebody up, if you're just pulling random people over and frisking them, that's clearly unconstitutional. And yet we do it. So um, we've reached the point where the old restrictions on government power have pretty much all melted away. And the people in charge now don't seem too interested in reimposing them. So I, I think that you know, we're at a really dangerous time. In, in Canada, uh, in Montreal, eight journalists had wiretaps put on their phones by the police. They received warrants for that, even though they said the journalists themselves weren't suspected of committing any crimes. And uh, also, Canada's spy agency, CSIS, admits that it's been collecting data illegally for the last 10 years. And their excuse was, oh, sorry, we just misinterpreted the rules. <laughs> for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so basically, um, you know, and it's always the case that if people who are, you know, naturally a little bit drunk on power and a little bit sociopathic, if they can get away with something, they will get away with it. And so we're allowing that. I, I assume that the guys who did the stuff that you just mentioned, Jim, are not in prison right now, right? No, they They're are not. They're still walking around free. Yes. Yeah, and and so there was no real consequence for their actions. They got away with it for a long time. Now they're going to get their wrists slapped, and they're going to go back to business as usual. So it's just a small cost of doing business now, um, in the same way that the mafia has to pay off judges and cops and politicians. You know, um, these guys every once in a while have to accept a fine or some public criticism, but it really doesn't matter to them because they know there's no real consequence here. Well, it's like the and, way the banks behave. Oh, my God. Yeah, the, U, the U.S. banks, they, they got bailed out with trillions of taxpayer dollars and then um, paid themselves record bonuses that very same year. And then after that, they've been caught cheating in so many different ways um, that, that are illegal, you know, manipulating markets and, and lying to customers really blatantly. And so they pay a fine. But the guys who did it, never get named, certainly never get prosecuted or imprisoned, and they go on as usual as, as parts of the aristocracy. In the, in the U.S., the um, Attorney General, Eric Holder, under 
Barack Obama, uh, actually publicly said that they, they're uncomfortable with the idea of prosecuting bankers because they're afraid it might destabilize the financial system, which means bankers are immune from the law. You know, they, they are above the laws that apply to regular people uh, regarding fraud and stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, once that's the law of the land, then that opens the floodgates. Bankers can do anything they want to and know that they might have to pay a small fine somewhere in the future. But it's a fraction of what they can make by manipulating markets. So they, they go on with it. Wells Fargo's fine amounted to three days profit. Yeah, yeah. And, and Wells Fargo was actually a fairly, um, extreme case because there was such an outcry that, um, the, the CEO actually had to resign. You know, he actually got called up to Congress and got grilled and then, uh, kind of got kicked out of the company. Didn't he get but a $124 million dollar bonus though to retire? <laughs> yeah, with? yeah. He, walked away um and he's probably on some yacht now throwing a party um and so even what happened to him can't really be called a punishment i mean he he had a bad couple of weeks and got a hundred and some million dollars for it i'll take a million dollars a minute to to have a bad week you know and and so that signal even that signal to the rest of the banking community was you know go ahead and do whatever you want and the worst that's going to happen to you is that you go, you retire rich, you know. So, yeah, yeah, we, we've got a lot of problems that we've got to deal with. And it's not clear that we're we're heading towards dealing with them. So I, I think, and I've said this for, you know, 15 years now, so it's getting kind of tired. But I, I think we have a financial crisis of epic proportions coming. And then at that point... When it's clear to um, a critical mass of people that the old system doesn't work, that's when we have the debate about what kind of a society we want going forward. And there's at least a chance for the sound money limited government guys to have their voices be heard and to reimpose um, constitutional limits on government and corporations and other you know, state and quasi-state actors. But that's not happening now. And it probably will take some kind of a, a, just a monstrous financial crisis before that becomes possible. We'll have more with John Rubino right after the break. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa, located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Rubino. John, was there anything that Trump said during the election campaign that would be good for business on both sides of the Canadian-U.S. border? Well, he's he's not a free trader. We know that. So we, we can assume that NAFTA is at least going to get a lot of public ridicule, if not be renegotiated. And that might or might not be good for U.S.-Canadian relations. It's hard to know because we don't know what the renegotiations will involved. And, you know, he's, he, he's bullying, for instance, auto companies that move factories overseas and then want to import back into the U.S., which, you know what, I get that. <laughs> if I was an auto worker, I would be loving hearing stuff like that. But that's, again, uh, problematic for international relations because it means that we're, we're not all trading on the same level playing field anymore and the whole free trade thing did turn out to have downsides that are bigger than the original proponents expected and now we have to deal with that you know we've got to address the concerns of people who who are being hurt by free trade and that's probably going to mean some renegotiating um i i find it hard to believe that the u.s and canada are ever really going to be too contentious because we're just, uh, you know, and I don't know Canadians probably don't like hearing this, but we're very similar. <laughs> you know, uh, we we each see each other as as slightly different versions of ourselves, and we, we don't really have any big national issues that are at stake now. You know, we want to be friends, and so I think we will be friends. Plus, uh, factories trickier. on both sides of the border are completely interlocked with each other. 
And yeah, uh, yeah. if you go uh, buy America only, as they found out a few years ago, well, 40% of our parts come from Canada on a same-day basis. Uh, we have no supply system that would just put those kind of mini widgets in. The Canadians make those. We make the big widgets. And together, yeah. we make the complete widget. Yeah, so so the idea that we're just going to get rid of the the laws that make that possible without some really serious consequences is kind of unrealistic. So I, I think when they sit down to actually, you know, try and keep Trump's promise to renegotiate NAFTA, um, they, they'll find out it's way more complicated than just um, tearing up a piece of paper and going on with business as usual. And I think the end result of that will be a lot less disruptive than the original promise was. At least I hope so. You know, there's there's no reason for the U.S. and Canada to have a lot of trade barriers up because we, you know, our, our workers make fairly similar money and our, you know, educational levels are fairly similar, yada, yada. Um, it, it's a different story with the U.S. and China or the U.S. and Mexico where the, the disparity between pay levels for factory workers is so outrageous that, you know, it, it, it just makes it incredibly cheap to move offshore and then export back into the country, that there, there's no real way to have free trade and not have it really impact um, North American workers or U.S. workers. Ironically, the peso went down 12% when Trump was elected, making Mexico even more competitive. Yeah, that, I know that is kind of ironic. You're right. Um, so, that yeah, that, that just made it that much more intriguing for a U.S. company to set up a Mexican factory and export back into the U.S. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's not clear how all this stuff works out because it's easy to say let's do it, but it's very hard once you get into it. But, you know, the, the British are finding that with Brexit now where they still don't have a plan in place because these contracts are complicated and they they don't just have a winner and a loser. They've got all of these people who are in a gray area who might be hurt or might be helped, and, and you've got to deal with the concerns of every single one of them. So this this is going to be a really complicated, very contentious, and possibly chaotic year as a lot of this stuff tries to get sorted out. Or, you know, are we going to um, now just eliminate Obamacare here? Because once you put something like that in place, you generate huge numbers of people who benefit from it. In other words, there are constituencies who um, will fight to the death to keep um, their their benefits, whatever benefits they've become accustomed to. And that's the way social spending works in the developed world. You know, once you create a program, you can't kill it because um, you've got some really committed people out there who want to keep it, and they will they will go to the wall for that. You know, they they will speak and scream a lot more loudly than any 20 people who aren't affected by the program and who don't really have a strong opinion. So, yeah, it's going to be messy. Well, I Trump has already said he's going to keep the parts of Obamacare that he likes. Yeah, yeah. So the, he, he found out right away that you can't just eliminate a program like that once it's been created. However, now Trump gotta... seems to have a, a big problem knowing the difference between being in government and running a business. He doesn't know what a blind trust is. He said he'd give his business yeah. to his kids. And now he wants his children, his adult children, to have top security clearance. Well, wouldn't give that, wouldn't that give them an unfair advantage when it comes to business? You might think so, yeah. <laughs> See, this is, um, you gotta avoid judging the Trump administration by historical conventional terms, because he's not a sign of business as usual. He's a sign of a break with past reality and past ways of operating. Um, that he got elected is, is a bit of a surprise, but that he got nominated w was enough of a signal to the establishment that things can't go on as they have been because, you know, conventional ways of governing the U.S. and the developed world in general ignores the needs of a huge group of people out there. We've got the, you know, disenfranchised um, that are that, that make up now a majority of the voting population. So if it wasn't Donald Trump, it could easily have been Bernie Sanders, who's now our president. Because had he got nominated, and he probably would have gotten nominated if the uh, the Democrat convention process was run honestly, 
um, it, there's an excellent chance he would have won, and we would have had a completely different conversation, but similar in a lot of ways, where where we're talking about his policies of, oh, yeah, a, a nationwide $15 an hour um, uh, minimum wage. Is that doable? You know, and, and, and there would have been a lot of issues with his policies coming from the left, which would, you know, and involve really hard implementation. Easy to say, hard to do. Um, so that's the nature of developed world politics going forward, I think. You know, then the next big deal is going to be Marine Le Pen in France, who now, after Trump, has a, leg- a legitimate shot of winning. And she would get elected with a uh, Frexit platform. In other words, taking France out of the Eurozone and out of the EU. And we'd be talking about how hard that will be, you know, technically. How do you do it when you're France and you're right in the middle of the uh, the continent and you're one of the founders of the European Union and, uh, and of the Eurozone, you know? And, and so all of this is now coming in one way or another. And it's just going to be complicated and contentious from here on out. You know, there's no happy solution to any of this. Britain's being punished during their Brexit negotiations because the negotiations are being held in French. <laughs> yeah, um, there, there's no reason for the EU to make it easy for Britain to leave because then that incents other um, uh, other political movements in other Eurozone and EU countries to um, to try their own wor- version of Brexit. You know, if it was easy for Britain and painless, then they can say, "Look, you guys, you guys said it would be terrible, it would be a crisis, but Britain is just fine right now." The European Union doesn't want that to be the case. They don't want everybody else to say, "Ah, you know, Brexit was a non-event. Britain just went on as usual." Except that they have all these advantages now. They don't have to take um, every single person that shows up at the British Channel uh, or the English Channel and uh, and and just let them behave like citizens, come in, do anything they want to. They don't have to do that anymore, and that's that's great. And so now, you know, France is going to look at that, and a lot of Germans are going to look at that and say, wow, you know, maybe we want that deal too. And then the um, the EU splinters and spins apart, and that's the biggest trading block, the biggest economic union in the world. So if the EU starts to spin out of control and the euro starts to lose adherence and and, uh, and and starts to fall into a crisis, and that affects everybody because a huge amount of trade right now takes place, well, first of all, within the European Union and then between the European Union and other parts of the world. And if you disrupt that, you're disrupting those other parts of the world, too. You know, you're starting a, a new phase of the currency war that, that will be just brutal, you know, if... Well, I'm wondering when in the Mediterranean, instead of taking people found in boats to the nearest European nation, they just turned around and took them back to Africa. What would that do? Well, that would eliminate the problem from Europe's point of view in the short run, but it would end up, you know, a lot of those people are coming in because they fear for their lives in these pockets of turmoil in the rest of the world that we basically created. You know, it's the West's fault that the um, Middle East is in the shape that it's in. And you can go all the way back to post-World War I when we started screwing with those people. Creating, and, uh, I would say, artificial nations that didn't really hook up with yeah. the cultures and religions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, during World War I, we wanted the allegiance of the Arabs, or the, the West wanted the allegiance of the Arabs. So we promised them a lot of independence, which, you know, the, the Europeans then promptly took back as soon as they um, won World War One. you know, and so colonialism was imposed on them. And then since that time, there has never really been a time in the Middle East when we weren't messing with them somehow, you know. In the 50s, um, Britain and the U.S. overthrew a democratically elected president of Iran and imposed a dictatorship on them. You know, we put the Shah in charge of Iran. And, see, that was a long time ago for Americans. But it was like yesterday for the Iranians. They remember that. And they've never really gotten over it. Um, and then since that time, there's been, uh, you know, an invasion every few years <laughs> by the West of some part of the Middle East. And so, of course, they're mad. And, of course, it, you know, it's a huge mess internally. And And so it's hard for 
people in the West to say, well, you know, you guys are just going to have to stay there and work it out yourself, and if the, the dictator kills you or if ISIS burns you alive, so be it, you know. We're going to wash our hands of it. It's not our problem. But, you know, you, if you're one of those people in the Middle East, you say, yeah, but it is kind of your problem, you know. You did it. <laughs> you caused this. So it, it's a really complicated issue. And there isn't a good side and a bad side. There's just a lot of different interests competing here. Yeah, and, there's uh, 5,000 shades of gray here. Yeah, there, there, there really are. And it's a shame that we brought the world to this point. So I think the, in the long run, the best way to deal with it would be for the Euro, U.S. and Europe to say, look, you know what, we, we recognize that we screwed this situation up, and we're sorry. <laughs> and, you know, let us do something to try to help now. Um, as best we can, and we promise not to invade you anymore. You know, we'll take our soldiers out, and you guys work out your own deal, and we'll try to minimize the the human cost of that inevitable civil war. Well, Trump and, has said he he wants to negotiate rather than confront. Yeah, and, and maybe that's why Putin was quick to call him and congratulate him. Well, that that would be nice. But every U.S. president comes in saying that. George W. Bush came in promising a humble foreign policy rather than the interventionist one that uh, that he was campaigning against. And look what happened there. So I don't know. If, if, if Trump brought in an entire new group of people who were on record and had history of being against intervention around the world, that would be one thing. But it sounds like he's just bringing in a bunch of neoconservative, you know, Middle Eastern hawks. That's well, uh, the only like. new face is a guy who ran a, a right-wing white supremacist uh, post on the Internet. Yeah, you don't think the guy from Breitbart is, is going to be a non-interventionist, right? Or, or if he is a non-interventionist, it'll be as a way of walling off the non-white people of the world and just keeping them over there. <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, see, a- asking for coherence, from what's happening now in the U.S. and from the political process in most other countries is asking too much. It's not going to be coherent, and it's not going to make a ton of sense from any kind of historical point of view because populism doesn't, you know, populism isn't a um, a coherent political philosophy where it has this set of policies based on this set of philosophical premises. It's not that way. It's just, look, You know, the masses have been screwed over by this elite, and now it's time for us to get ours back. That's basically populism. So some good can come of it, but it won't be a coherent set of policies that we can point to now and expect in the future. That's not how things are going to go. What is a Trump government going to do to currencies? I mean, we saw the peso drop 12% in one day. What about the rest of the world versus the U.S. dollar? That's anybody's guess right now, because what the um, the Trump campaign is talking about is a massive infrastructure build-out financed with borrowed money and newly printed currency from the Fed. Okay, so that's basically Paul Krugman's um, Christmas fantasy right there. Uh, so that's going to be an easy sell, because you got the Trump administration wanting it, and you've got the, the entire left loving the idea. So that... That will pass. We will have a big infrastructure build out. And we'll have a bigger deficit to finance it and more money creation. Normally, <laughs> that would be bad for the dollar. Um, so you, you could see that as an aspect of the currency war, you know, where we try to devalue the currency in order to make this new debt we're taking on more manageable. If we don't do that, then that's a problem for multinational corporations headquartered in the US who want to export to the rest of the world because their stuff is getting cheaper is getting more expensive as the dollar goes up. So it you know if the dollar stays strong or gets stronger from here, then you got to figure corporate profits in the US are going to contract. And that the the equity prices would have trouble um justifying themselves since Corporate profits have already fallen for a couple of years in the U.S., which means the P.E. ratio, in other words, the amount that you've got to pay to buy a stock in the U.S. relative to the earnings of the underlying company, keeps getting more and more expensive, keeps going up. And at some point, 
you know, and, and historically it's been this point here. You know, this level of valuation usually leads to a stock market crash. So it's completely possible that that's what we get, some kind of big financial crisis brought about by a too strong dollar. On, on the other hand, we could get inflation from a, a weakening dollar and rising government spending, and that could push interest rates up, which causes a financial crisis of its own. There, there's no way to know exactly what crisis we get, but I think it's safe to say that a crisis is coming, <laughs> and it was coming before. You know, this is just a new set of policies that won't fix the amount of debt that we've taken on and might make things worse. That was coming regardless. So I, I think that this is the kind of world where gold is really favored by economic conditions and traditional investments like stocks and bonds are, are going to be problematic at best and maybe horribly, horribly bad investments. Well, a statistic that came out today, 9 of 14 recessions started after U.S. elections. Yeah, that's pretty typical because usually what happens is that the, uh, the government in power increases spending really dramatically in order to get its people elected or reelected. And then after the election, You've got this little honeymoon period where you can you can throw out some bad news and still get away with it. So they slow down the increase in government spending and and the, the increase in money creation and, and try to rein in these aggressively rising trends. And that slows the economy down, cuts corporate profits, causes the stock market to to fall from its elevated artificially. Um, election year levels. And so, yeah, it wouldn't be a surprise to see that happen again, except that the Trump administration isn't coming in with any idea of scaling back the Obama administration's aggressive increases in government spending and deficit spending. Um, so if we hit the ground running with a big infrastructure program and tax cuts and new money creation, it's hard to know what that does to the economy. As I was saying, we, we have a lot of different cross currents at that point. John, thank you so much for chatting with us. Sure thing, Jim. My guest has been John Robino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website, dollarcollapse.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.